Welcome, thank you very much for joining. My name's Eric Baber, I'm the ELT Product Training Director and together with, with Gordon, who will introduce himself in a moment as well, um, we're doing this, this joint presentation on developing teachers in a global network. We're going to be looking at some of the challenges and some of the solutions around what turned out very much to be a, a, a partnership effort, not just between the two of us, between also some additional partners who are also sitting here in the front row, so you will get an honourable mention. But um, Gordon, I'm going to hand over to Gordon to describe some of the, uh, to give us an overview of the scenario. Great. Well, hi, my name is Gordon Lewis and I'm the uh, vice president for the language category or vertical as we call it in Laureate Education. And um, just want to set the context for you a little bit. So Laureate Education is probably the largest education organization that you've never heard of before. <laughs> yeah? um, we're a consortium of universities around the world, about 70 universities in approximately 27 countries that all have their own names and all have their own identities and function autonomously but are united by a common, um, a, a, a common ownership or, affili or affiliation. We have about 8,000 English teachers, we estimate. It's very hard to figure out because we have a lot of freelancers. And there's about 1.3, 1.4 million students studying in our network, of which approximately 200,000 of them are identified English language learners at this time. So the, the background of this is that we went out to our network and we said to ourselves, um, what is the real value to our networks to being part of a global organization? And back in 2008, 2009, there was a survey conducted, research done, and we asked the question, what could the network provide that would give added value? And what came out loud and clear and far and away above any other thing was uh, support for English language instruction. So um, at that point then we issued a um, request for proposals from a number of different organizations to try and meet the challenges of providing um, the English language resources to the network um, which led to our, um, uh, to our engagement with the partners that Eric just mentioned. Um, I just would add one thing is one of the challenges that we have are the high number of part-timers here. We don't have full-time teachers um, in, in most institutions, either in terms of English language teaching or um, uh, for the core content professors. So this is, this is challenging. And when we started, there were no consistent policies and no standards um, in place. So I'll hand it back to you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> So as Gordon says, um, so, uh, quite a range of challenges were quite quickly identified. Um, first, first and perhaps foremost is that there was a, a great uh, variety of levels of the training and experience across the network, especially since um, there was a, there was a client sort of, of freelancers who maybe um, worked, taught one or two hours a week to full-time employees and everything in between. Some of them who were freshly qualified to people who'd been um, you know, in the field for 20, 25 years, whatever, so the whole range. Um, another big issue was that there was a uh, substantial range of language levels of the English teachers from B1 to all the way to C2 or even native speakers, so a whole range. As Gordon also alluded to, because each university certainly originally was very independent, they had different expectations, um, their marketplace had different expectations, um, so the language or the students who came in perhaps were, had, a, had different aims for what they wanted to achieve by the time they came out, and this has an impact on the teaching that is delivered. One of the things that um, Gordon and his team were very keen on doing was de developing a blended learning program. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the partnership with, with us with Cambridge University Press came about and I think it was a huge learning experience for both of us, um, both in terms of the product that we ended up uh, developing, the course, which was very much a, a blended course, but that in itself raised a lot of needs and requirements on the part of the teachers. Uh, most of the teachers were experienced in delivering face-to-face -face classes and they now had to find their way into how to deliver a blended program. Um, and so there was a substantial uh, professional development need right there. Next, so um, with regards to that, some of the institutions had quite robust internal professional development programs, other didn't, and there was an attempt to sort of bring uniformity to the professional development um, being delivered across the network. 
as again, as Gordon has already alluded to, some of the, the, the QA, the sort of quality assessment, quality assurance at universities didn't really address the language component. So they might have had initiatives at upskilling teachers in their particular subject area, whether that's science, maths, health sciences or whatever, but that didn't necessarily extend to the English language delivery. So that was a big piece right there. And finally, and um, this is perhaps, this is one thing that unites all of them, um, is that we really wanted to, to bring the universities into the mainstream of ELT. Um, some of them had been, well, they had all been their own independent institutions with various sort of outlooks um, and, and ways of dealing with English language teaching. And Gordon felt very strongly that he wanted to bring everyone onto a similar page, bring in communicative language teaching combined with a uh, blended learning approach. Um, so we really had our work cut out for us collectively. So this led to a quite uh, um, a large number of partners, so there was ourselves. We initially focused um, a great deal on the materials, as I say. So we started out with a face-to-face with -face course, and we, we basically redesigned that as, as a blended learning course for, for Laureate. On the back of that, we then basically had to build out a training, um, a training ca uh, capabilities. So we had to identify and work with trainers in various other countries to go into Laureate institutions to upskill their teachers in the blended learning. We also, that also led us to developing online modules in how to do this blended learning thing. Um, because they, they were just with, as Gordon says, there were 8,000 teachers around the world. There, just was, there was no way that we could ramp up and have enough face-to-face -face trainers to go into each institution um, and, and, and deliver training. Um, the other thing, as Gordon said, is there's a lot of freelancers, uh, so there was a bit of turnover as well. So whenever we delivered some training, six months later or a year trainer, new teachers had come on board, which required training again. So in order to scale things up, um, we, we, we built out um, a number of, initially about uh, five, uh, no, actually I think it was more like 10 online modules aimed at Laureate teachers that has since morphed into something, uh, something different, which I'll refer to later. Other very strong partners were Bell Education, uh, Cambridge Assessment, and the Consultants E, who developed um, a range of, again, online modules um, around various aspects of, of e-moderation in particular, and also around online standards. So it was, it was really a, a, well, at least a five-way partnership um, and it's taken us eight years. It's been eight, eight years in the making now. That's right. Okay, yep. back to Gordon. Right, so as I mentioned <coughs> earlier, this didn't um, happen in a, a commissioning um, a project in a group of, um, uh, of, of um, uh, partners just, just, just on our own from top down. This was the result of um, uh, decisions taken with the universities as a whole. Now, one of the um, solutions that Eric was talking about were our online certificate modules. So in addition to the product training that Cambridge could provide on the, the specific blended learning solution that we chose to implement in the universities, we felt it was really necessary to have some for, form of, of standard training, in, which is not only a training for online, but just generally speaking, um, a, a, a standard training in English language teaching, um, which would allow us to essentially speak the same language within our network and be sure that when we're talking about things like communicative language teaching or um, uh, for that matter assessment um, or CLIL, that, that, we, that we, we were on the same page here. So um, together with our colleagues, in this case from the Consultants E, who worked with us on developing these modules, we've created what I would like to think is our, our nice Laureate internal CELTA-esque solution, yeah? which is important to mention is is necessary for us to provide to the universities at at, at no charge so that the people can get their professional development um, in, a, in a way that matches their, their, their cultural and economic context. So we love CELTA and we encourage CELTA and DELTA, um, uh, but we recognize that not all of our teachers are going to be able to access that. And this was our internal way of providing something that we felt was, was powerful and, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and similar. Yeah. Um, 
Do you want to take this? Yep. 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 Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So to, to sort of supplement and complement that, as I say, we brought out um, a number of initially very product focused um, online training modules, but then we expanded on those as well. Um, so we, <coughs> we, we then delivered um, modules and on, are delivering online modules around blended learning, um, how to use online workbooks, um, and also on data, interpreting students' performance data. This is a key thing that we found uh, that teachers needed a lot of support with. As I say, when they're in the classroom, they can see on, st on students' faces whether they've understood something or not. They can change and adapt their teaching on the fly. In a blended learning program, they need support in looking what students have done online, interpreting that, seeing what the students have done well, what they haven't done so well, where they need help, uh, with, what they need help with, and then adapting their lesson, their next face-to-face -face lesson accordingly. So that, 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 that's a cornerstone one. And then a key one is teaching with, with Touchstone. Touchstone is the course that is being used uh, throughout much of the Laureate network now. Um, we've also, <coughs> or over time, we've built out quite a range of methodology courses. Uh, some of you might be familiar with, with those um, under the umbrella name Cambridge English Teacher. We're now shifting that, we're changing that a little bit, um, but those methodology courses will still be available online. One thing that we were keen to do, both in terms of reaching as many teachers as possible, um, that, was, that was one uh, key uh, sort of thought behind or incentive behind producing these online courses, but what we felt strongly about was that we, uh, teachers would benefit from studying online themselves. This would allow them to familiarize themselves both with the technology, the learning management system, but also the motivational issues around online study. It's one thing for teachers to say to students, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do the other, but we, you can really tell that the penny drops with teachers when they're on the receiving end. When they have to take an online course, that's when they recognize, all oh, right, okay, if I'm studying on my computer, it's ever so easy to just flip over to Facebook, see what my friends are doing, check my emails or whatever. Just very mundane, but crucial, um, motivational issues like that that need to be addressed. Okay, back to Gordon. Right. Um, in addition to the, um, what you could call the standardized <coughs> trainings that we, um, uh, that, that we introduced in the network, another thing that we um, began working on as early as 2009 was, uh, was establishing a community of practice. And um, we've heard this word bantered around um, uh, uh, here at IATEFL and in other conferences, but for us, a, the, a community of practice takes on a very special meaning. We are using our community practice as a workflow hub for our directors. Basically, what we're saying is that all the information that you need to do your job, all the knowledge that we accumulate within our network will be found in this community and we are trying to make sure that we uh, put all the conversations there because it's our belief within this network that myself and my team at the global level that we have two things that we're trying to achieve. We're trying to push information out to the network, but we're trying to pull best practice into the network and redistribute it through the community of practice. So this involves peer-to-peer -peer discussions, sharing of ideas and experiences, um, turning basically information into knowledge and then taking the, 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 the strongest elements of, of, this, of this practice and, and creating a repository for that, for that practice. We have an online language school, for example, right now, and those teachers in that online language school are creating data banks of lesson plans and tips and ideas and, and, how to, um, and how to deliver courses not only in a blended environment but in a 100% online environment as well. And as you can see in this um, uh, 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 diagram, you can see the types of things that we've been doing and the number of, um, uh, of um, uh, activities. And uh, you can see culinary arts and health sciences because those are my partners from the other uh, verticals within the Laureate Network. And so we're pretty proud to see that we're kicking them. You know, we're doing very, very well compared to my colleagues. So then they don't know I'm saying that here, of course. Um, and we also chart these, these communities with quite succinct metrics. So if you take a look on the other side, the solutions, you see the uh, graph of the actual activity over days. Because one of the things in working in private education like I do is, uh, is that we do have a double bottom line. 
Yeah? We have to maintain academic quality, but I do have to account for what I'm doing in a financial sense and be able to show the value of what, what I'm doing um, to my network um, uh, leaders. And showing these kind of statistics on the community really demonstrates strongly that something is happening here. And it's the network delivering knowledge. And, um, and that's what we think is going to lead to the, um, to the success over time. It's that combination of the community, the standardized training, both internally and the standardized training from the partners, which gives you know, a, a, a full um, support to the network. Um, Oh, I guess that's looking at it again from a similar per perspective. Um, the other thing here, though, to mention here uh, are the, is, is quality assurance. I'm not sure how that got so little there, actually, but I hope you can. Sorry, I see why. There we go. Quality yeah. assurance. Sorry, I'm seeing something different than you are. So the other thing in, in terms of training, communities of practice, and then quality assurance. And quality assurance is something that we've done in collaboration with Bell Education also since 2009. Bell had their quality assurance scheme. We adapted that, that, that scheme to our realities within, within our network. And then we um, sent um, basically Bell assessors out across our network to provide um, a, an analysis of, of um, uh, how our universities are progressing according to a number of key performance indicators. Yeah? Um, now what has happened over the last year or two though is we realized that it was hard to get traction from university leaders um, by having a strictly developmental module, uh, model. We had to have some form of key performance indicators which would require university leadership to actually address the problems that are identified by the quality assurance. And so what we did was petitioned to turn the quality assurance um, uh, 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 scheme into a set of laureate international standards, which is what our, we call our LISA standards. So as of last year now, the universities now have to um, uh, uh, address the language standards um, in, the, in the network. And we have three levels of standards, bronze, silver, gold, which they can aspire to. There's a lot of flexibility in the standards. Um, they can choose where to put their priorities. Some schools may have limitations on class size. In South America, for example, we often have very high, large class sizes, but they can all, approach other elements of the standards and gain points there. So it's not lockstep. Every university has to do exactly the same thing, but it's pushing them forward up to maintain a balance of points across all of the indicators that we work with. So up to now, we've had 64 standards visits that we've conducted over the, over the years. Um, and we now have language policies. Um, and this was another thing. Not only do we have standards, but we have policies. And the idea here is to get the, the language um, uh, programs aligned to the university mission. So are we going to attack English media and instruction in our universities? Well, then our language programs have to be developed with that in mind. Is the goal to get our students to a B1 proficiency? Uh, it, does it vary by, by the subject areas they study? All of these things are going into the language policies that are being developed by the universities with the assistance of Bell, with the assistance of Cambridge Assessment, who come in there and look at the curriculum documents together with us. And then we meet with the universities and we say, okay, this is where you look like on your standards. This is what your policy says. This is what you need to do to get there. Not today, not tomorrow, but maybe in three years or something. And then we proceed and take all this training that we've been doing over the years and focus it more strategically than we, than we have in the past, including face-to-face -face trainings, the blended solutions, the COP engagement to get to the online goals that our, that our network has. Our university network has a goal of 25% hybridity. Now that's a term that has many interpretations, but basically what it's saying is 25% of all education in the universities needs to be delivered digitally. Of course, having a, 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 a digital solution in the English language area makes this very interesting for them to meet their, their, their goals. And one final thing is that since we are going more and more online, we said not only do we need the standards um, from Bell for the face-to-face -face and blended solutions, but we also need international standards for online, which is something we're working on together with the consultants E now to actually begin to um, uh, apply to our universities within the next, within the next months. I think it's yours now.
I think that's, yeah, okay. Actually, well, this is a joint one. Okay. So, so here, here's a range of, <coughs> of sort of metrics of exactly how much uh, development, teacher development has been delivered over the past seven to eight years. Um, so the, the, the teachers in, uh, in the DM teacher training, so those are the Laureate internal ones, mm -hmm. um, over 5,000 teachers have taken part in them. The e, the e moderation training, 360. The Cambridge English key, uh, teacher courses taken are 110. Um, that is due to rise significantly now where we've rejigged things and made them available in a slightly um, more straightforward fashion. Um, I'll let you talk to the aggregate exit level in that, because so yeah. that, that's a tricky sure. one. Well, obviously, <laughs> when we um, get down to brass tacks and talk to the leadership of our universities, they want to have some key metrics. And uh, of course, you know, I can talk about professional development all day long, but they're going to say to me, well, what's with the student outcomes? You know, are, are they meeting their goals? And what are those goals? And way long ago in the ancient history, we said B1 for all universities, right? And uh, I didn't, I didn't make that up, so I'm not going to take a, a responsibility for that. But what we have realized over the years is that actually these goals for universities have to be diversified. We have certain universities where a very strong A2 is probably a far better target than a, than a, a very hard to achieve B1. But in other universities where we're going into English medium instruction, we're going to have to hit that B2, C1 threshold. But what we wanted to find out, though, is where we actually are. So we were utilizing um, the uh, Cambridge Assessment Benchmarking Exam, taking um, sub uh, cohorts, uh, representative cohorts of students learning in our network. And from 2009 to 2015, we've been analyzing them every two years. And what we have been able to show, and we're quite happy about that, is that we've been able to push the level on aggregate across the Laureate network up one Cepher level. Um, uh, in this period of time. And uh, so the average, if you took all the universities, would be at about A2 plus right now. So we, we, th we think that that's a success and we, something to build on. And in the coming year, we have a new assessment we're going to be working with. It's called Lingua Skills. It's a new one from Cambridge Assessment. And that one is going to give each student a score report. Um, so as opposed to testing subsections of cohorts of, st of students on exit, we're going to test everybody so that we can really have a comprehensive measure of what we're doing. But I think what it shows, though, over time with patients, we have been able to, to, to lift that metric by a considerable number. I think um, what one thing that's been borne out as well by, by research that's been uh, performed by ourselves and it's resonated with you as well, is that actually this, the, this level which has been bandied about with the target level of B1 is actually not hugely meaningful. Um, what is being found now is that um, employers especially will, will either say, well, A2 is fine, that's enough, or this role actually demands B2 or C1. So overall, aiming for B1 is actually not particularly helpful because it means some students are having to invest more time than they really need to, while others aren't getting the English language that they need. So a sort of blanket approach, both for the Laureate Network, but also sort of globally, mm -hmm. um, seems like it's, it's not really that necessarily that's useful. Um, but what has been very, very good to see is that through all the joint efforts, um, student attainment of Laureate students has gone up which I think validates all of the, the CPD efforts that, that all of the partners have, have jointly put in. Um, last thing I would still add is that it, one thing, I think it's fair to say that no two years have been the same. Um, as soon as one challenge has been met, um, another challenge has popped up, or we have set ourselves a new challenge, or the environment has changed, or something like that. And by the same token, I think both organizations are no longer the same any two years in a row. Um, so I think the whole landscape is constantly changing. It's interesting, um, it's, and it, it, it's really, it's wonderful working with, with, with a greater team like this who all complement uh, each other and work towards a sort of a, a, a stretching ourselves and trying to meet the next big challenge. Yep. So that's it for me. Any final words yeah, from you? Yeah, just one final word. Well, like, where is the future going with this now? We're looking for the next three years. And I think one of the things that is particularly important for me um, is to start focusing on um, the, the teacher as an um, independent actor. What we needed to do in those first years was get some standardization to make sure that, um, uh, that, that we could measure ourselves. Um, but now I think what we're trying to do is diversify more. 
offer more um, uh, material and content, and try and make sure that our teachers are able to take critical decisions in their classrooms uh, through their own um, instinct and knowledge of, of, of their students. So that is the challenge you know, for the next three years, to see how we can do that. Um, within the context of knowing that we're still going to have um, uh, freelancers who may be working one hour with us in Mexico City and then hopping across the city to work some, somewhere else. But uh, that, that, is, that, that is the goal. The community of practice will uh, play a, a, a big role in this. Um, and um, I can already see some development moving in that direction. I'm confident um, that we're going to get there. So hopefully in three years we can report on what happens with that. That's okay. It, that, that's any that's questions? It. Yeah. Any questions too? Gavin. Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Gavin. That wasn't for you. That was for us. <laughs> Sorry about that. The exit level thing. I think a lot of times um, organisations traditionally aim for B1, B2. They seem to be the kind of the, the sweet spot that everyone thinks they should get to. But I was always, I, I'm always reminded of, of one of David Gravel's research projects, one of the right. recent ones, I can't remember which one, where he talked to thousands of employers and actually they didn't want these, they wanted A's or C's, yeah. but not these. And that, that research was really what got us thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I think the university um, presidents uh, saw, the, saw, saw the light there because we have many, um, uh, I wouldn't call them vocational, but um, uh, universities targeted at emerging academics. F you know, st uh, students who are the first people in the family to go to university. Yes, and that is exactly right. Yeah. So it's a vote for our impact, really. The <laughs> mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Either over 12 weeks or six. Mm -hmm. And it just jumps out to me that the trail course was shorter. That's not why. Um, it just simply had, it, it, actually, you want to comment on that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, we, we worked on all of these courses. I think um, primarily at that point, I think CLIL was a, an unidentified need in terms of numbers of people. And so this was more of a, a, a feeler, putting out feelers to see exactly what the demand was. I mean, there was clear demand for some of the key skills like reading and listening, and writing, you know, some of the real core skills. Uh, but the CLIL was um, a growing thing, but not necessarily where it, you know, it might be in terms of demand. Um, there probably is a clear case for revisiting that. At some point. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, it has morphed over time. For one th thing, is who were, are actually taking the CLIL course? And what happened was we realized that we essentially had two versions one for the content professors who needed that support um, in CLIL, and then for the English teachers. And increasingly in our network, the CLIL course is being focused on those content professors. So it probably, as Gavin's pointing out, probably needs needs to be looked at again and, um, and, and rejiggered for that. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add to that, that we're talking about tertiary clinics. Yes, tertiary that's right. Mm -hmm. I, I take it that clear is an approach mm -hmm. where you are worried about the language as well as the content, whereas EMI, you sort of typically find it tertiary, you're not worried about helping learners the language, you're just getting content across. It, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and this this is mo this is moving increasingly to be an EMI course. Yeah, because of the pr shifting priorities of the university. In the beginning, the goal at the university was how can we make the English language instruction more meaningful, and the way to do that was by grabbing content from the subject areas that the students were studying. So give architects some architecture content, and that was the goal. But now there's a big initiative on foot, especially here in our European region, to develop EMI solutions and start offering the degrees in English. So probably, as you point out, probably CLIL will need to be changed as well to EMI. Yeah. I think we've got time for one last question. Yeah. In, in putting this together in, in terms of teacher involvement uh, 
if they're you know only working for you an hour or, or at one institution or something like that or part time. Well, one of the things in the standards that we have is the percentage of full-time versus, versus um, part-time. So we're trying to change that on that side as well. But it's interesting because we have also seen that many um, uh, adjuncts understand the value of this, that they can actually get this professional development from us. And we're hoping that that is something that would um, uh, 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 add value and convince them to stay longer with us. But one of the things we want to do, that we've been meaning to do, is to disaggregate our teacher training and to, and to provide smaller, bite-sized chunks of learning just in time, in a way how they need it. So um, breaking these, these, these um, uh, development modules up or building on them and creating what we like to call missions, yeah, which we will get to. But we haven't s figured out precisely the way to get there yet. But just a smaller, a smaller nugget of learning that a teacher can grab and say, you know, within the community, I, I have to um, uh, teach a certain type of reading text. How do I do that, you know? And to be able to get that knowledge, either through a colleague, through a training, yeah, or through a, a, a document that is available. So, um, but to make it more, more, um, uh, 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 more accessible and more on demand. And that's something that we very much took into account when we were building our modules, that rather than 25 hours, these are one to one and a half hours in duration, because we recognize that the realities are very few teachers are going to invest that time um, two days before the training or before they need to teach. And Jocelyn? Time <laughs> is up. Let me see what there's. Get to also enter another pool teaching centrally more than we survive. Yeah. So I have teachers who teach at those institutions, but I have teachers who teach centrally first online. And I think that's being a privilege to them because number one, it's one of their favorite offers. And they get to be a part of the community practice of teachers all over the world. So I think we're being told that we have to vacate the space, but if you have any any questions, um, Gordon.Lewis at laureate.net or Eric.Baber at ebaber at cambridge.org. E and happy to discuss it further. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you.